Hello, C.H. is true here, and this is the conclusion to the religion and science debate. And i got to be honest with you, I kind of feel like it might be the conclusion to this channel also. Um, it's kind of a sad moment, but it's a transition. Um, and so I want to end my time on this channel, if indeed it is the end. I can't prove it, but I get the strange feeling that it is. I want to end it with a bang, and that is I want to kind of return to the beginning of the channel, a discussion of mathematics, of set theory. Um, I tried to get this channel off the ground as a math channel, and I just didn't have that impetus to really do that. Go to the Khan Academy. I mean, go to, go to places that do that. This channel is more of a philosophy channel, but even there, I think it's maybe a little bit scattered. But I want to end the Science and Religion series in a way that's meaningful, and in a way that I think is um, gets beyond Kent Hovind on one side and Christopher Hitchens on the other side. You know, in both cases, you're dealing with people who have a problematic relationship with the truth. In the case of Kent Hovind and people of his nature, lies seem to be uh, commonplace, not just slipshod scientific arguments, but slipshod financial dealings and, and send... I don't think Kent Hovind does this, but there are other Christian minister types who say if you send them money, you're you're going to get rich. Okay, I mean by all means tithe to your church if if you are a Christian, but um, I tend to think you would want to do it to with a church that has a homeless shelter or blankets for flood victims or something like that, something honest. And you guys on the atheist side, you're going to Christopher Hitchens who helped to sell the Iraq War, a war based on lies. He has a problematic relation, or he did when he was alive, he had a prob problematic relationship with the truth. He did not tell the truth, and I would not go to somebody like that for the truth. No matter how glib, no matter how brilliant he sounded, no matter how he could turn a phrase, and he could, but I noticed the weakness I noticed that Christopher Hitchens went up against some modern Orthodox rabbis, and boy, did he look bad. Um, these rabbis knew their Torah, and they knew their Shakespeare. These were smart guys, and they knew how to argue religion, particularly modern Orthodoxy, which is more liberal and less fundamentalist than, let's say, the Haredi and, and the um, extreme end of Orthodoxy. And they really, really, um, Christopher Hitchens tried to run intellectual circles around them, and he couldn't. And the reason that he couldn't is because his arguments were not about truth. They were about slipshod um, one-liners, just the same as a lot of these religious fundamentalists who talk about um, their so-called evidence for, for creation or bananas that are shaped like the human hand or something like that. These are not honest people. These are people who get your money for books or videos. Um, I advertised on this channel for a while and decided after a while that I was not going to do that because I was going to have the a number of reasons, but one of them was that I'm going to have the old-fashioned YouTube experience here, okay? And I want to end my religion and science series and possibly my channel itself on a note of there has to be an honest dialogue. And the more honest your leaders are, the less they're going to be involved with one-liners, with dishonest arguments, with um, uh, slipshod reasoning, and the more they're going to be engaged in a fruitful dialogue. Um, and, and I want to end with, um, I think, an argument that really would be I'm going to, I want to end this channel with, if, if it is indeed the end, with the beginning. And that is George Cantor, infinity, levels of infinity. Um, at the very beginning of this channel, I gave what I considered to be an argument for the continuum hypothesis. Um, I didn't, you know, take for, with it what it's worth, but here goes. And that is, George Cantor was a deeply spiritual man. His, argue, his exploration into set theory was one that was deeply, deeply spiritual. He wanted to discover the absolute in mathematics. He wanted to discover the infinity beyond all infinities. 
And he believed, rightly or wrongly, that by affirming the continuum hypothesis that he would eventually get to that ultimate level of infinity beyond which there is no beyond, because it's the ultimate level of infinity. Now, there are levels of infinity mathematically. There's the infinity that corresponds to the rational uh, numbers, and that would be the infinity at the countable infinity. Then there's the infinity that corresponds to the reals, which would be the power set of the infinity that corresponds to the rationals. That means that the permutations of rational numbers, all the ways rational numbers could be organized, that that number of ways that could happen would all add up to the real number of real numbers that there are, meaning the infinity of the rationals, the power set of that, would be the infinity of the reals. Now, if you don't understand that, I don't really have the time to explain it to you, but the bottom line is what he came up with is the idea that for every level of infinity, there must be a level of infinity above it, whether it's constructible in, in mathematics or not, that it must at least hypothetically exist because the permutations of that infinity would be greater than the infinity itself. So the number of ways you could take rational numbers and construct them or rearrange them or, or so forth would be a greater infinity than the rational numbers. The same with the reals. The number of ways you could construct the real numbers would be a greater level of infinity than the reals. And so Cantor had a problem, and that is if you're going to talk about an ultimate infinity, are you then going to have an infinity beyond that, based on the idea that of the power set of that infinity, which precisely would be 2 to the power of that infinity, whatever it is, would be an infinity beyond that infinity. So if I have an ultimate infinity, call it omega, what about 2 to the power of that infinity? Would that not be an infinity beyond omega? And so, even though Cantor himself was deeply spiritual, the other set theorists later on tended not to be, uh, Bertrand Russell, and um, later mathematicians tended to be have a very clinical understanding of set theory. And um, eventually Paul Cohen proved that the continuum hypothesis is undecidable. On the, well, Gödel and, and Paul Cohen both proved the undecidability uh, together, they, they prove the undecidability of the continuum hypothesis with standard ZNF set theory. So that means that we can't know if it's true or not. And that would propose a, a probably even a further problem. But I propose a possible model of infinity that would be, would answer Cantor's paradox. And that's the idea of infinity that goes beyond mathematics itself. In other words, if you have an ultimate infinity in which there is no separation, no x and no not x. And that would not seem to make sense. That could open all kinds of logical paradoxes. I mean, it's a debatable idea, but if you could posit that. The infinity in which there is no duality, there is no separation, there are no separate objects, then you would also have no permutations. I mean, by definition, to have a permutation of a set requires that there be members of that set. But if you have a set that requires no members, not even the null set. It just goes beyond the whole idea of having a set with members of it. A set that goes beyond sets. Then in some sense, you no longer have the power rule, right? You have, you have ultimate infinity. You have what in Western religions we would call God, what in Eastern religions would be called the void, by which they don't mean literally nothing. They just mean that which is beyond what can be explained. You call it the ground of all being. You can call it the... Um, the Einsolf in, in Kabbalistic thinking. Um, every culture has a different term, but if you're going to talk about the set that requires no separate objects to be members of it, then you have, in a sense, gone to ultimate infinity, in my opinion. Now, I'm short on explanation for that, meaning I'm not going to go into it because I believe it's an experience. And I believe that this experience is open to those who would, would be open to the experience. Um, I think the less that is said about the experience, the more that experience can be experienced. I think even Wittgenstein, who's cast as an arch-rationalist, spoke of the truth that, about which one cannot speak, or that goes beyond language. And maybe there was something that was missed there. But if I'm going to end this channel as I began it, I at least want to make it mean something. And if I can 
maybe open the doorway to that experience. Perhaps I've accomplished something. CH is true. 